Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. That's normally me sounding like RuPaul. I'm just doing my impression of you. Oh, well, you're doing it. It's spot on. It's spot on. Spot on. Uh, for anyone who is new to Hula La and jumping in at a really weird place, I'm Alistair. <laughs> I'm Sam. <laughs> and welcome back. We've just had a week off. We have. It was an unplanned week off. We basically have been religiously posting Hula La every week for the better part of a year. And this this was just the one week where life was just getting a bit heavy and a bit much. And um, I felt really bad. I felt really, I felt quite guilty about like being honest. <laughs> and we, we were like, when we said we we decided we weren't going to post and we were like, how do we tell people? Like, should we make like a funny meme? Should we whatever? And I was like, no, like, let's make like kind of a like a semi, you know, semi sincere. It's still, it's still the city gaze of Hula La. A semi sincere kind of post being like, hey guys, it's like a bit of a heavier week. We're not going to do it. And your guys' responses to that were very lovely and wholesome we got lots of lovely like dms oh, so nice. and tweets and i was very grateful for that because it made me like feel feel like you you care about us they like me they really like me they do everyone was like, it was like you don't need to apologize kings <laughs> you don't need to worry i got someone message and go like hey like wellness check how are things i was like things are actually fine we just didn't have time right now Literally. i said it, i mean and i was fine when i answered that question i then went down with a very aggressive throat infection my pain threshold is very low i'm very dramatic when i'm sick (laughs) i am just not a calm person when i'm ill i just whack everything up to 11 um and and i wasn't feeling well so i'm really glad actually in the end that we took that break you just started a new job as well which i i I hear has gone well so far no i did i did i I started a new job i i mean i I work in tv as everyone listening to here knows and i sound like a real wanker when i keep going on about it but i started a new contract and it was really intense but very good it was a lot of like new responsibility and it was just a very intense week and it was a nothing went wrong it was a very good week but it did mean hulala kind of fell on the back burner for a week so thank you i hope i hope when we post this you lot are still there Think, please, please to listen to us. No, they've Feed gone. Feed my ego. They've gone. Oh no, they've gone. They were all on a thread, and it all relied on the absolute rigidity of the schedule. And if you drop that, we've got nothing. You joke, but I have said on the podcast before that I quite religiously make a plan for Hula La, and I like plan a few weeks in advance and like the dates and stuff. And missing one week quite like through my plan and I had to go through and like reschedule some things and replan some stuff. So it'll be worth it in the end. We really did need that like mental health and physical health in your end <laughs> break. Yes. Yes. You know what it makes me think of? Um when you say like I work in TV. Wow. Um it's that it's that quote when um Jamie Lee Curtis for some reason like really drags Leah Michelle on that podcast with Jonathan Groff. And Leah Michelle's like, yeah, we won seven Tonys for that show. And Jamie Lee Curtis is like, but you didn't. <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis is Jamie! Like, oh my god trauma she's for like, Leah the trauma. show did but you didn't oh my god god bless her the anyway, trauma funny so yeah this week's been very busy for me you've been recovering from an illness which to be honest I think for a few days I just thought was you being run down from Manchester Pride it really could have just been that as well well that definitely set me off mm. I'm sure it did and I I really paced it. Like I'm at a point in my life that, well, I've always been at a point in my life <laughs> forever <laughs> that I don't have a lot of stamina with nights out mm-hmm. and like, I need to really, really pace my drinking. And so I didn't have like a crazy Manchester pride, but there is a lot of like consecutive nights out, a lot of meeting different people. It's a very social experience, which I find very draining, but like also just means you probably are going to pick up something from someone at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that sounded like very suspicious like, mm-hmm. <laughs> no it's funny like everyone's, everyone's like have you had your monkeypox jab I'm like when was the last time you had your flu jab oh <laughs> but there was a particular highlight that I posted on my Twitter I can't call it my ex account I mean on no. my Twitter account and on my story our good friend Reese, who does the Gallifrey Cabaret had tweeted to say like just met Rusty Davies on Canal Street he was a lovely man and I was like ah oh, damn like what an experience. Like, you know, I, was, I kind of said to people with me that I'd, I'd have a meltdown if I ever met him. I'd just, I'd just melt because I wouldn't know what to do, to be honest. And it's it's one of those experiences as well. It's almost like one of your heroes you almost don't want to meet because if it went badly, it would just kind of ruin your life <laughs> and just like shatter your worldview. No so you. I was sort of like, you know, I don't think I could handle it anyway if I did meet him. And um, I'd seen him the day before because he marched in the parade with, I think it was the George House Trust. Okay who support people living with HIV. 
and fabulous that he was with them, fabulous that he was supporting them. And he looked so happy and he was waving and he was within like a couple of meters of me. And I was like, that's made my pride already. That's lovely. So on the Monday, there is a vigil, which is just the most wonderful thing ever. And it's definitely something that like I've never experienced at a London Pride celebration yeah, for sure. where there are like really good speakers and poets and singers, really well chosen, just very good, inspiring speakers. Where is it? Is it near the Alan Turing Memorial? Yes, it okay, is. It's I in know that part. Yeah. They've got a stage and as you come in, you make a donation and you receive a candle and at the very end, you like that at the vigil. And it was really, really lovely. Great hour. Everyone's in tears and we're all slowly making our way out of the park and kind of putting down our candles and some people are lighting little tea lights at the end and we all kind of move over in that direction where we can see these tea lights all lit on the floor and me and my friends are kind of stood on one side and just across the other side kind of like two meters away again is like Russell T Davies <laughs> and I'm kind of looking across the way and I'm like ah shit like, <laughs> shit he's here and I was like this obviously is not an appropriate place to yeah, corner someone sure. and in and in general in life like I've always kind of said to myself if I see a celebrity and they're in public and they're just kind of like living their life and they're not like at a meet and greet function I never really want to go up and disturb someone and be like can I have a thanks because I think that's so annoying yeah and um you know, like if, if, you know, someone famous is on the table across having dinner, I'm not going to want to go and like disturb their meal with friends and be like, hey, can I get a set? Like, yeah, you know, they're yeah, having yeah. a private moment. So this was a bit of a, like, a, mm, and especially in the context of the visual, I was like, that's not appropriate for me. No, to, like, for sure, for sure. Them. So I was like, let me, let me just see what's happening when we get out of the park. Because my <laughs> friends who were with me were like, you really owe it to yourself. To, you have to say hello. Like, you have to say something. Like, you can't, it's like the person you have to say hello to. So we were kind of like shuffling out of the park, but like without stalking him, without like cornering him, we were just keeping like a loose follow on like, let's just see. Not you stalking up. RTD. <laughs> so he was just kind of like heading for one exit and we were kind of heading for like another near exit and just keeping an eye. And we were all moving at like a snail's pace. I was like, don't look, don't look, don't look, don't look, don't look. And then we got out into the street and he kind of lingered in the street talking to his friend. And I was like, I've got to go and do it. I've got to go and do it. I was so very, I very over. proud of you. I had to do it. And I, I said, like, I'm not going to, like, ask for a pick. I'm not going to plug a podcast. I'm not going to go over and, like, sell my wares and be like, hey, Russell, like, have you heard of Who La La? Like, no, he hasn't. And he doesn't care. Yeah. Sweetheart, he doesn't care. So I was just like, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, Really? I just, I just I sort of love everything you've ever done, really. And you're just sort of one of my personal heroes. And I just think you're brilliant. And I just wanted to say hello and thank you. And just wanted to meet you, really, and say that. And he was like, oh, that's very kind of you. And I was like, yeah, that's just all I want to say. <laughs> uh, you know, I just love everything you've ever done and you're brilliant. And he's like, oh, that's, that's very kind of you. It's very appreciative. It's very nice. Said, oh, what's your name? And uh, it's a bit like speaking to Santa. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm, it is. I was like, I'm Alistair. He's like, Alistair. He's like, thank you, Alistair. And then off he went into the night and off I went into the night. And it was one of those like, wow, like, I don't know if there's anyone I would have rather met or like really any way I would have rather done that. It was just one of those like core memories now I can keep kind of safely tucked away. Because that was like when I, when Reese had met him, I messaged Reese and I said like the one thing I'd honestly want to just go and do is just like let him know like how significant his work is to me. Because obviously I don't need to go on about like, oh, I sit with my friend and we talk about his work like, <laughs> every week. Even though we do it. <laughs> Even well, though like, we do At least an hour every week. And um, I just want to like genuinely like say like, say, like, oh my God, like, thanks for doing all this. Like, you know, your career has been very meaningful for me. So um, that was it. Like, what a moment, really. And I'm pleased to say like, he was he was an absolute sweetheart. Like, you know, just small things. Like he, he, he was, he seemed genuinely grateful to hear that and made great eye contact and wanted to know what my name was. I just thought it was just, it was just polite. Mm. He was really nice. He didn't need to be polite because he could have easily been like, no, sorry, I'm, you know. I'm, I'm just about off. to go do something. You know, he, 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 he could have very yeah. easily been like, oh, I'm, I'm just headed, like, oh, sorry. No, like I'm heading. Sorry, I'm, I'm, someone, I'm heading Someone off. today no. tried to give me a fly for a gym and I was like, no, thank you. And then walked on. Like he could have no, just done well, Exactly. He could have just been like, I can't hear, pretending not to hear me, whatever. And I would have been, I would have made my peace. Well, I would have made my, I would have I devastated into a ball. But <laughs> yeah, but he, he would have been within his rights to do that. So um, anyway. No, I'm really happy that for was you. My, That's such a dream. moment. That's such a dream meeting. I think like, yeah, if there is one queer person who has 
truly shaped my life beyond obviously you know queer liberation and there's so many there's so many queer activists who have changed our lives in so many other profound ways but like it's for someone who has like directly affected my life and my queerness and like my how I sort of come to term with my identity like he is definitely up there and I think like you know like I've said before I've met David Tennant and that was like one thing because I love oh, David God, Tennant yeah. I love Doctor Who but meeting RTD would like I don't want to say I'm jealous. I don't want to say, you know, I'm happy for you, but it should have happened to me. <laughs> no, I genuinely am. I'm come really next happy year. Come there. next year. I'm come sure he'll year. be there. Yeah, I'll come. We'll come it's funny though because like... Scoping him out. Yes. Um, in Shooty's recent... Oh, this was big Doctor Who news that we have to acknowledge this week. So I think oh, for yeah. the, like, maybe the first time, like Shooty ever gone what? Was it an L? What was it in? Uh, yeah, no, it was L. He, he said about an L. He's like, for the first time, described himself as queer, which is so exciting mm-hmm. because we've now got like the first openly queer doctor, which is That is super huge sick. news. I mean, running a Queer Doctor Who podcast, that is news, hey? <laughs> if we had some kind of meow, 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 buzzer. Wait, hold on. Just for it. one second, I'm going to play the Campbell Damp music. Here we go. Whoa, hey. And it's off again, don't worry, it's off. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, no, that makes me so that's happy. That's how it felt when we read that. I feel like it is up to every... It's it's a tricky conversation because there are so many celebrities that um, you see, and I think Shooty was one of these for me, where you see him in his media and you see him in interviews and stuff, and he gives me such a queer energy that I love, and I don't want to assume someone's... Not derogatory. <laughs> Non-derogatory. Non-derogatory. Um, very, very affirming. No, and I don't want to assume anyone's uh, sexuality or gender or anything of the search, and I think that has really damaged people before in the public yeah. eye. So it was really, really affirming to see him be so open, because there are so many queer artists that like come out down the line but they're very like oh you know i don't need to say i'm gay i don't need to do this and you're right you don't have to but that is something to be said for having an openly queer doctor before their reign really one mm-hmm. of the different words starts it, it, it's just so profound and so special and i just think that he's such a great herald for the show and i think him working with russell and millie and the entire creative team is just going to be a bloody good season of Doctor Who. I think it's going to be a bloody really, good, good season of Doctor Who. It's just so exciting. It just allows me to like sit and chant like, you know, one of us, one, one of us, one of us. us. Exactly. <laughs> and I couldn't do that before. And I love that. Yeah. Today, we are looking back at your idol and your new best friend's first era of Doctor Who. Uh, uh, we're looking at the companions of Russell's first era of the revival of the show between 2005 and 2010. And let me tell you, this is a huge topic, even though we are only looking at the companions for the first era of Doctor Who. We're talking about between 2005 and 2010. We've got your Donnas, your Marthas, your Roses, your Sarah Janes. And we also want to look at all the companions that never were, all the people that nearly were companions. And let me tell you, this is far too big to fit into one episode, absolutely is, which is why, for the first time in Hulala history, drumroll please. Oh. Don't hate us with being a two-parter. <laughs> ah, boo. Two-parter, that sucks. No, I don't think so. I think, basically, we realised that this episode... <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so either. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, just a preface. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. No, it is. There's so much content we want to talk about with these characters that we didn't want to, like cut their screen time short if that makes sense we want to give them all the time they deserve we're not going to be doing anything too like deep dive we want to give you all the facts and stuff you know all that but we really want to talk about what we thought about the companions and our experiences with them growing up and we want to give them all the time they deserved so this week yeah. we're going to have a quick look through all of your tweets we did tweet you we want you to be involved in this episode too we're going to have a look at what you thought about the companions this era and then we're going to look at rose and sarah jane smith and we went on twitter earlier and we did a call out saying what do you guys think of the companions of this first era and let me tell you the public have thoughts, and so do we. The public have thoughts, and they are all positive, you'll be pleased to know. Well. Oh, no. No, no they are very, very positive. They're evolving positive. Uh, Ethan, who's been on the podcast before, said, My favourite girlies, shout out to Martha for introducing me to this crazy blue box show. I love how independent she is, and the fact that she walked the earth for a year to inspire hope against evil. What an icon. Wow. Okay, I'm looking now. Jimmy says, I like Rose, not in season four though. Martha and Donna are both incredibly overrated and will be towards the bottom of my ranking. I generally prefer the one-offs like Astrid and Christina to them. Dun, dun, dun. See, this always gags me when 
people think <laughs> when people don't agree with me um obviously everyone's completely entitled <laughs> you're always gagged when people don't agree with you every time every you're single like, time what? i'm like how could you possibly <laughs> no because i mean that's a completely valid thought like i think that there are loads of really great one-off companions and i think there are definitely things against rose less so martha i'll say more so rose that could like have her pay like further down the rankings but i don't know they're just all my children i couldn't choose between them yeah 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 Okay, Matt says, at their best when they're allowed to be really flawed. I know it rubs some people up the wrong way, but I love how possessive and codependent Rose gets with 10. Mm. I like that. We heard a lot of that actually about flaws. Uh, Joey says, just the best. They were people, flawed, silly, likable. They had the adventure of a lifetime, some of the best ever companions. Oh, see, it's it, this is really interesting. I'm really glad that we, we have these tweets to look at because uh, Kyle says, the best era, but not necessarily the best companions. There were so many different types of characters Characters that made me think it was great. Think of the Stolen Earth. Would any other Doctor Who been able to have this episode with over 10 other well-known characters all fairly heavily involved? And I think that's a really good point because the era as, the era as a whole had so many companions beyond the main companion. Like in series one, we had our Rose, but we also had Mickey and we also had Captain Jack. In series two, we also had Sarah Jane. Then later down the line, we also had the whole TARDIS family coming back in. Canine, Luke, Tortured. There were so many different balls in the air. And in a finale like that, we really got to know all of them and it didn't feel like anyone was like a waste of space if that makes sense like it, it didn't feel like like it felt like everyone needed to be there and made sense being there yeah that yeah. makes sense for sure and all their personalities really stood out against each other as well like they were mm. all kind of well thought out characters enough that they all had like quite distinctive characters i think when it got to that point too yeah you've said this before that if you could do like a multi-companion episode you would make sure that every companion was there to like bring a different skill or do a different thing and i do think that that was used in the finale i think that rose had the interdimensional technology and ability i think martha came with the military know-how of unit i think donna was there obviously later becoming the doctor donna with her like eternal link to the doctor and i think that everyone like brought something to the table that's so true. You know, like, given the chance, I'd have, you know, Dan being a tour guide. I'd have Ryan charming someone with his charisma. Mm -hmm. I'd have Yaz put someone under arrest. <laughs> <laughs> Is she still technically a policeman? I'd have <laughs> all of those memorable personalities come together on screen <laughs> in a way that really <laughs> brought out the best in them oh. i'd have benny's wife benny? screaming where's my um, benny have you heard out. benny that's my favorite cut thing that to out. do cut that out. no i'm keeping cut it i'm that keeping out it. turn that I, um, light out <laughs> Can, can I say a tweet that really made me laugh that I've just seen? Yeah. <laughs> so in the tweet that I posted, you can put four pictures to a tweet and I put one of Rose, one of Martha, one of Donna and one of Kylie Minogue as Astrid Peth. And at Martha Gonzalez tweeted us saying, I love Rose and Donna. I like the person... I like Rose and Donna. I like the personality of the two of them. However, Martha did not please me at the time. And then they go, <laughs> the last girl in the photo, I liked a lot, but Rose and Donna always. I'm like, put some respect on Kylie Minogue's name. <laughs> <laughs> the last girl in the photo. The last girl. Kylie Minogue. Kylie Minogue. Pa -dam, pa -dam. Cool. Awesome. I loved it. Oh God, so funny. So we weren't sure how to approach this one because quite a big task to talk about kind of all the companions in this era. Like so we're going to go one era. at a time a five-year era and i've written a helpful summary of this companion's arc and then we're just gonna we're just gonna chat shit yeah. about about that person <laughs> that makes it sound like we're gonna like talk about them behind their back <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe we will maybe. and then we're gonna move on to the next one with that so, <laughs> so. <laughs> i love how you described this i love it it's funny that's how it's gonna run no, it is. Yeah, we just thought we didn't want this to become like us teaching you who the companions were and like when they started you know, the show. And, you like, already know. You already you know already all know. that. You already know. You want you're here for the for the hot tea and our opinions <laughs> that, that obviously <laughs> clearly hold a lot of weight. Um, the tea's not that hot. The tea's not that hot. But no, Alistair, he has <laughs> uh, written. It's important, I think, to have a little summary. And Alice has written some really great little. Uh, I've written really good summaries for the for the companions, and I think we just got to kick it off with 2005, baby. All right, 2005. Let's start. Let's start. Rose Tyler. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Rose's journey. We meet Rose Tyler being raised by her widowed mother, living a mundane life of retail work, very online boyfriend, and chips. 
things change when she provides free therapy to the sole survivor of the last great time war <laughs> using her cockney charm to make him less violent. Rose battles Slavine, Chloe Webber and Satan, becomes the bad wolf entity, falls in love with and indirectly kills the doctor, gets trapped in a parallel world where her dad is still alive and returns one last time to watch Donna step in front of a lorry and take a human doctor home with her. Congratulations. That was really good. If that's just a taster, I, I will say I've not actually properly read them all. I read Did Roses. Did you not one. read them? Oh, no, I read, okay, I read Roses. No, it's a good thing. I read Roses and then I was like, I don't actually want to read them all because I want you, like, this was so funny. Okay. I want to react in real Great. time. So that one I had already read, but I haven't read your other summaries for that reason. Um, I can't sure. think of a better summary of, of her adventure on Doki Who. I think that really covered it all. I, I love the bit where you said uh, she battles Slovene, Chloe Weber, and Satan. <laughs> <laughs> just a sample of her enemies which i think is quite cool also a scribble i forgot that one as yeah, well that she was did what well, it was like it's, uh, it's basically the same material as an hp pencil uh, i know uh, rose what can we say about rose i oh bloody love the girl i <laughs> <laughs> i love the girl i love the girl i think that she i so pardon my french i am quoting beyonce um my like one note just says cunt to the feminine or what because <laughs> yes she is uh, for want of a less LGBTQ term, uh, mother. She is mother to all. Right. I, I don't know. I love her. I'm rambling, but I just can't say enough about Rose. I think a lot of it does lie with nostalgia. I think that doing, doing this podcast has really made me see some flaws in the character, like deliberate flaws, but reasons why she might not be such a great person. I think day by day, I think that with <laughs> Rose, she is very, her wider, like, outlook on what is good and right in the world and helping people is great it's there but then her day by day living her life rose as in like the rose who won't break up with her boyfriend but will fall in love with a time lord like that's the rose that might be a bit of a dick sure yeah but yeah i th- i like i like that she's mm. 19 she's, she's 19. 19 she's a baby she's 19 who cares you know <laughs> she's you're like yeah she can be so nasty she really can i mean mickey she's she's so selfish but i love that Mm -hmm. i love that i do yeah it's really hard to say like how much of rose's character do i like and how much do i like billy it's too intertwined for you i think it's too much it's i can't tell because billy piper as a performer i really really love and like goes without saying her best work is not doctor who like the stuff she's done since doctor who is like extraordinary like yerma play performance is extraordinary i hate susie is incredible really really good and i went back and restarted it recently and it's just like staggeringly good she's just such a good performer i was so sad i mean i know that it was a covid thing but i was so sad because series one i think it's like eight episodes or something and then series two was only three episodes and it was so mm-hmm. sure and like that's literally my only critique because it's she's very much is like creatively leading that show and it's really interesting because she said she's like oh Susie isn't based off me like it's not at all based off me it's a completely original character and i'm like so you're a singer Su- sorry Susie is a singer turned actress who goes on a sci-fi show and gets really popular and is thrown to fame going to all of these comic-con style events and then ends up in a rocky marriage and i was like "Ah, ah." there's elements that she's drawn on for sure she says it's not quite a bold biographical but it's it's definitely got some elements in there i think for sure um back to rose i wanted to be that woman very badly um Mm. right down to the details like down to the details when i was when i was a teen not even when i was a teen when i was eight nine years old Mm. she steps off her london bus and goes to her retail job and i looked at that and i said that's my dream that's all I want. <laughs> that's what I want to do. I think I looked at that and I was like, that's all I want to do. You were like, like you, you don't understand. I, just, I want to work at Debenhams. I want to work at Debenhams. I want to, no, I mean, she worked at Henrik's, which was like meant to be like, I guess like in Debenhams. Yeah. But like, it was, it was like set on like Regent Street, wasn't it? It looked like Oxford Street. Like a, Yeah. Kind of like, but this is the thing, from the outside, it kind of made it look like a bit like Fortnum and Mason-esque. And then on the inside, baby, that was Debenhams. It was Debenhams. And I know which Debenhams it was as well. <laughs> I know exactly. I know which Debenhams in Cardiff that was. But um, I mean, right down to like, she had like a little like denim side bag thing going on. Mm-hmm. And so like, I had a little denim bag. Did and you? every time I wore it, I was like, just like You just had Westminster Bridge <laughs> in your head. I did. Oh, well, I had it in my iPod as well. I had it, and I had it in my ears. Yeah. I love that song. And I just um i don't know what it was about that that like i think i just found like everything about her like you know even before meeting the doctor everything about her like effortless mid noughties kind of like disinterested london girl who just is so like sick of everything and nothing happens in my life and i was like yeah yeah 
yes, that's so cool. Um, something about like, yeah, the monotonous London lifestyle. It just it just appealed to my soul. And here I am living it day by day. I know. I do have to admit, when I first moved to London, not long after that, I was getting off of the tube and I had Westminster Bridge playing in my ears. And it was like, dun, 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 dun. And I was like running up the tube and coming out. And I think I was coming out at like Piccadilly Circus or somewhere. And I just really was like, I am Rose Tyler and no one can tell me otherwise. I'm her right now. Also, I think underrated fashion icon. I think like Clara quite often gets told as like the fashionable one. Rose really served some looks in her era. And I think what I liked with it is that they were very like, the costume designers and the hair and makeup people were very playful with what she did. Like she would often do like a mid like updo or she'd have like little like plaits and then she'd have lots of denim, but then also have like really graphic tees and like jumper. And like she really was fashion. You know, the one time, well, one time she did serve. Let me start with a positive. One time time she really... I'm just picking out a highlight, mm-hmm. Sam, would be the like punky fish, um, red and black, like hoodie zip up thing she wore on like um, Satellite 5. It's in like the long game. Mm-hmm. And she's got like the spiky kind of up up bun thing. Oh, that was that was like unnecessary how cool that was. It was. Um, one time I felt like she didn't, which was unfortunate, was the like blue hooded thing she wore in like the two-part series two finale what was that with like flared like work trousers i didn't i didn't mind like for me like that wasn't like a sleigh but it was fine (laughs) i don't for i really rogue choice from me i love in dalek when she wears the the blue jeans with the white vest and like the long i I don't know what she's done with her hair it's kind of like as if it's like been in a plait and has come out and it's like wavy but in a like mid updo half down half up (laughs) yeah i just thought that was that was really really good you know what's good as well about her looks i love as well that we like almost like led into this like we were going to do a character analysis and then we were just like Girl. yes the best <laughs> she when clara came on and like clara, clara really did have looks but clara looked styled clara yes, looked like she did styled she looked like oh this is like what they thought i should wear for the editorial today yeah whereas like rose just looked like i thought of this i thought of this and i found mm-hmm. this in like a space thrift shop and yeah I like, yeah i wonder if it was the same costume team I, I know that it was in majority the same hair and makeup team and costume team throughout his era. I don't know if it was necessarily the same between series one and two, because I feel like they almost play her safer in series two and certainly in series four when she comes back and she's wearing the same outfit for the whole time. Whereas in series one, I think they were just a lot more, and it could just be to say that it was the mid noughties and they were filming in 2004, but I feel like she tried a lot more stuff with her hair and her outfits and things. I, I really, do you remember what she wore in, in Love and Monsters at the end? She had like almost cornrows, like yeah. in her hair. You upset my mum. You upset my mum. You mom. upset my mum. Yeah. No one funny. upsets my mum. <laughs> and then he starts I crying because of the slab in the floor and she's like, oh, baby, Elton. Yeah. Okay, let me say something that's not like super superficial here. Um, I really like her emotional performances. I always find yes. Billy Piper's emotional performances very convincing. When she looks upset and she's like, kind of like shaky and breathless and... <sighs> that was my impression. There you go. <sighs> <laughs> no, do it one more time. Do it one more time. That wasn't even how she does it. Do what it one more that? time. I don't know. I don't know what that sound was. That's not how she did. Anyway, when she's just like a bit like you know. Anyway, always find that very convincing. She always looks like genuinely really upset, and I'm like, oh. The the moment I think of when you say that, and I, I completely agree with you. I know we've been kind of joking about her looks and stuff, but Billy is such an incredible actress, and like you've said, her filmography across multiple projects really does show like her acting chops. But I always think of the scene on Bad Wolf Bay on Doomsday, and she's trying to tell the Doctor that she loves him, and she kind of goes like, <gasps> and she can't quite like get the words I out, and she goes like, you. I, I love you, and like I, maybe I was you. crying too. I would have been what seven, eight years old. I was crying too. She's snotty she has hair in her eyes Mm -hmm. it's such a mess it's amazing the scene oh my god i can't talk about rose without talking about uh, in the parting of the ways the finale of series one she has that scene there's a very complex uh, scene where she's talking with her mum about having met her dad who died when she was a baby we've done a deep dive on this in hula la series one you should come back and listen to it and 
there's this really complicated, emotionally hefty scene where she's trying to explain to her mum that she's gone back in time and met her dead dad, who she never had the chance to meet as he died when she was a baby. And her mum just, Jackie, doesn't want to believe it and doesn't want to hear it. And she says, I went back and I saw dad. You were there. Like you remember there was a girl with blonde hair. You met her. And she, and she sort of, She's talking really soft at the beginning. She's like, I went back and I saw dad. And her mum's like, stop it, stop it. And by the end, she's shouting and she's like, that's how good the doctor is. And that's how much he cares. And her mum like runs off and screaming and shouting. And and Rose just sits there to herself and like sort of doubles over and just cries. And it's such an emotionally hefty scene. And I, I've seen it a million times. And every time I see it, I get chills. I truly yeah. do. That's one of the best ever scenes. That's the kind of performance I mean. That's a great, great example. That's a great example. Mm. So I think I would love that kind of performance. That feels very real. Like even when she came back in series four, actually, um, when the doctor's dying and regenerating in like, I don't know if it's the stolen earth or yeah, it, yeah, it's no, somewhere it's the stolen earth. And the doctor's going to change and she's like, oh my God, like don't die. I came all this way. And she's like sobbing. I always just find that performance so convincing every time. I love it. Because she knows, I think it's it's really hard as well, because she has been steering Donna at that point to the point she needs to be at to break out of the parallel world. And I think she's kind of felt like a mentor to Donna at, at that stage. And Donna doesn't know what generation is. And Jack knows, and Jack is quite prepared. And I think Jack isn't as like maybe quote unquote superficial or like tied to how people look. So he's like, right, let's go. This is happening, go, go. And, and <laughs> here we go. And poor, poor Donna's like, there must be some medicine or something. And, <laughs> and I think Rose, she's trying to explain to Donna what regeneration is. And she's saying, you know, when he when he's dying, his body, it repairs itself, it changes. But then she just kind of stops and she can't do it anymore. And she just but goes, you but you can't. Come on. And it's just such and then when he doesn't and she realizes that it's still him, it like it's such a cute <laughs> There is a scene though, however, in, in the next episode that makes me laugh. I'm thinking of the same one. I don't know that you are. Maybe you are. Oh, is, is it when Jack get, when Jack gets exterminated? Oh no, I'm not. <laughs> so <laughs> Jack that. gets exterminated and Rose doesn't know that Jack's immortal. And she comes up and she goes, Oh Jack, oh no. <laughs> and the doctor's oh, no. like, Oh, leave him. And and Rose is just like Oh no. <laughs> and that's oh, basically no. it. What were you thinking of? Oh no. The one I was thinking of is when she's like, Right, I'm gonna find him. Control, lock me onto the TARDIS. <laughs> and then she kind of <laughs> does the pose. Gets into this position, hands on the hips, like one leg jutted out, and it's like <laughs> Oh my god. Oh god, so if you haven't good. seen it, I can't describe it. So she good. decides to just like go from like, right, I'm gonna find him. And then suddenly she's like dead modeling. Superhero pose. And yeah. it's uh she slays for like one second. It's really, really good. It's very funny. I feel like I, I don't want to linger on Rose too much because we have a lot more companions to get through, but I do think we need sure. to touch on the love story because in none mm. of the other companions of this era of Doctor Who anyway, has there been a love story quite like this? And I think it was really the first time in Doctor Who there's been a proper love story between a Doctor and a companion. What did you mm. think of the love story between the Doctor and Rose? I mean, I guess watching it for the first time, I didn't even question it. I was just like, this is a love story and it's nice and I like it. And then I guess as time's gone on, I think I probably resist the idea of it being done again. I think it was unique because of like the circumstances that both characters found themselves in. Mm. And I probably now like more find myself in the camp of like thinking of the doctor as more of a, like an asexual creature. Yeah. Who's almost like such a spooky, ancient, eldritch creature that like, is kind of like almost like beyond human relationships that like friendships make sense. And like a deep love in another sense, like the love he had for like Amy and Rory makes sense. But like, not or like even the love that i think was there between like 12 and clara really makes sense like almost like how that became like that like obsessive love they had for each other like that extremely yeah. passionate but like not sexual love they had for each other um i i think that like all makes sense for me i think like the the relationship with rose feels like that was that was truly unique to like her and ten and i wouldn't necessarily want to see it again yeah no that's a really interesting way of putting it and i do think much as the groundwork is laid there with her relationship with the ninth doctor i think she kind of looked at him like 
a friend and also kind of like a mentor and like she kind of was like learning from him and also I think growing quite a lot because also you have to remember in series one she's 19 and there is something a little bit icky about like a 900 like I mean I'm in my mid-20s and I wouldn't <laughs> date a 19 year old so like some, <laughs> someone in their like 900s dating a 19 year old I was like mm, I don't know what's up with that bro what's up with that bro but I yeah I love the love story I Check know the TARDIS data banks Check the databanks. We need to know. We need to know. Release the redacted files. Uh, that's what we all thought redacted was going to be. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that I understand the criticism and I understand people saying the doctor should really be, like you said, should exclusively, I'll say, be asexual and not have any kind of emotional ties and that way to companions. I think Sylvester McCoy at the time was very vocal about it and he was like, or maybe it was Paul McGann kissing Grace in the TV movie and he was like, what would the doctor want with humans? Like he'd find them disgusting. And I was like, that's kind of fair. Like I get, I get that. I get that. I, I think that's a really good point you made that they were both in quite a unique spot in their life where they found each other at the right time and gave each other what each other needed and they made each other better. And I think that that is why the love story for me really works. I guess like, because every doctor gets like a slightly different personality. Like the doctor is a set of ideals. And then within that, there is like the soul of the doctor that carries between bodies. But then like the personality, which is like the 10th doctor, which becomes the human doctor seem to also just be like the right match i guess for rose which kind of made sense i guess but yeah it's interesting it's a funny one because then like 11 and clara were like almost like a bit of a pseudo boyfriend girlfriend thing at one point and then kind of fell off i don't know anyway yeah i don't know i do like that um i think billy piper said in an interview recently they were like she said she wasn't really happy with where she left things with her character and the interview was like oh why and she was like well i didn't end up with the doctor i ended up with the other guy like you know yeah yeah she was really like yeah because he's he's not he's not the real one it's not yeah, as good i get that so i get that as well i i also don't totally remember why she had to stay in the parallel world with him because the world I think it's like the Doctor, The each world only, each universe, sorry, can only really deal with having one Doctor. I mean, think of all the issues and problems the Doctor has caused being there. And the Doctor Donna couldn't be there at the same time, and they certainly couldn't be two Doctors, and that universe didn't have one, and he needed her to help make him better. And the Doctor was like, the universe is safer with only one of me here. Which is funny, because he's bumping I, into himself. I find that silly to me because you could have just grounded that doctor and just been like right you stay on earth you don't get a sonic you don't get a tardis you're a human being and you're going to stay put but also billy piper was only contracted for three episodes <laughs> i mean back to the parallel world like, you go. i'd do a spin-up if I, if a spin-off I could just i'd do a spin-off if it was set in london and four episodes i'd be up that like a rat up a drain pipe. Uh, yeah <laughs> yeah like a rat up a drain pipe uh yeah i actually don't want her back in who it has to be said i think her story is closed that's a good thing there's i think in my opinion not really room for her to come back now that's fair unless it was set in the parallel world i don't really want to see that i don't really want to see like domestic bliss for like david Tennant and billy piper it's just a series i don't need Mm -hmm. um i am quite happy to just say that rosa's story is complete fair enough well it's interesting talking about love stories and stuff because the next full-time companion really did have a love story of a different kind. But before we stop off at St. Martha Jones, I do really want to quickly touch on Sarah Jane Smith. Yes, let's do a very quick check-in on Sarah Jane Smith because she did appear in series two. And four. And four. And then had a spin-off of her own. <laughs> and then she had a spin-off all this time. Ah, yeah, I completely Okay, never mind. <laughs> I know that because I wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> give us give us your bio. Give us your I, bio. I just forgot. I got, I got confused. We first meet Sarah Jane Smith as an early 20s journalist sniffing around a military base. For her sins, she's taken to the Middle Ages, going on to fight Daleks, meets a T-Rex, prevents the release of an ancient god from Mars, and witnesses the birth of robot Nazis. She's one of the few companions the Doctor describes as a bestie. Despite this, he dumps her in Aberdeen and doesn't return for 30 years. Presuming him dead, she makes a life for herself with a male-presenting asteroid in the attic, Mr. Smith, fighting threats from Ealing with adopted children and other minors. Oh my god. I, I, at the time that I really realised just how... You know how we talked about Amy and Rory recently and we were saying about how their finale where they died was just like the one adventure that went wrong? I feel like yeah. in Turn Left where you see them help the Royal Hope Hospital and they just all die. 
Sarah Jane leads these die. three teenagers into this adventure and they all die. And I was, I, I'm like, oh shit, like she was putting these kids in a lot of danger, like quite regularly. But that I loved was it Mr. Smith's same. reaction. That was Mr. Smith's reaction when she didn't come back. I was like, oh shit. Seems like they done yeah, fucked up. Do you know what would be really that cool in the episode? Weird tangent I know is if Rose was bait in the turn left scenario where the doctor dies and Sarah Jane dies. If Rose, instead of zipping in and out, based herself in Bannerman Road and used Mr. Smith to track Donna down. That would have been a cool little segue. That could have been cool. That could have been cool. That could have been cool. But anyway, back to back to Sarah Jane. I adore both Elizabeth Sladen and Sarah Jane. Obviously, I didn't really know who she was until she was brought into the show in 2006. And I think that's the perfect reason to bring someone like Sarah Jane back because she really was, to my knowledge, the like fan favorite companion of the classic era. I remember my dad, before I even really knew who Sarah Jane Smith was, talking about the Doctor and Sarah. And like that was like the Doctor and the companion. It was the Doctor and Sarah. And I think to bring her back and sort of reintroduce her to a whole new generation of kids and then especially giving her a spin-off show in a children's format, making her have a family of her own and also this like extended family going on all these side quests and different adventures, but like on Earth. I just think that was such a smart decision from Russell and the creative team behind that. And it just let the whole world fall in love with Elizabeth Sladen all over again. I think that she really is just a talent unlike any other. I agree. I think, as you said, really cool that she got introduced to another generation of kids and very cool as well that Elizabeth Sladen, Sarah Jane Smith kind of set like a new template for the companion back when she was brand new and gave the companions something to do, which Mm. was nice and made them a lot more useful, a lot more resourceful than they have been in the past, even though I think we've said this too, Elizabeth Sladen felt that actually Sarah Jane Smith kind of in the classic run was actually a little bit of a cardboard cutout and not the most helpful person. Um, But I think as well, I really liked her story when she first came back in series two. I really liked when she turned up with K-9 and it forced this kind of conversation with her and the Doctor about like, I thought you'd left me. Did you forget about me? Did I do something wrong? And it asks all these questions about like, what happens to the people who get left behind or get too old for this? And forces a really interesting conversation with Rose about kind of imagine what it'd be like to see someone wither and die, someone you love. Um, Mm. And that's all quite interesting. No, I agree. I think, I think we need to give some time in an episode of its own to Sarah Jane as a spin-off character, because I think that she really grew and became an incredible character just purely within her own right of that medium. But bringing her back in school reunion, I think really it was it was both great because we love Elizabeth Sane and we love Sarah Jane, but it was necessary, I think, for the Doctor as well to kind of be faced with the ramifications of his actions. And she says, like, I just thought you died. You left me and you didn't come back and I thought you must have died. And I sat here waiting for you. And she kind of was saying that she's not wasted her life because she's taken the lessons she learned with him and implemented them and sort of is doing her own investigations. But she has never put time into having a family and never put time into things for herself because she's been sat waiting for the doctor. And then it is a really great story point for Rose as well, because like you said, she's faced with the ramifications. Someone saying to her that, you know, I was as close to the doctor as you were once and I was to him what he is to you now. And he left me and you just need to be careful. She just warns Rose. She basically, she's like, I, you just need to be careful because I know what it's like having a relationship with the doctor and I don't want you to go through what I did. And I think that was a very important point to have in that segment of Rose's story. I totally agree. Such a cool way to bring her back. That isn't just like a cameo inclusion, but actually like serves a lot of like narrative purpose. She said that she was like, I wouldn't have come back if you, if you'd have just had me in a passing shot, like as a quick cameo, she was like, I wouldn't have come back. Yeah, yeah, I really liked it. And it felt like it was like a really mature conversation that happened. And I, I really liked all of that. Mm. I think with giving her her own spin off and giving her so many series and giving her so much to do, I just think it's cool as well that we had an older companion, an older woman on screen who was just actually like given a lot to do mm. and was also like quite like a badass action hero in themselves. For sure. Who could really look after themselves, who looked after the people she was with, you know, like, and, and was like, I guess, I don't know what kind of relationship would you say she had with like Clyde and I think that it was mentor mentee. I think well, two things. I think it was family first. I think uh, that was my like only note, well, note really is that she I really like the family she created not just with Luke and Sky but with Clyde and Rani and Maria. I think she made a family, but I think she definitely served as like a mentor mentee. And I really I've been begging you to do this. And I know you haven't listened to the Beyond Bannerman Road Big Finish stories because you really then see even more of the legacy of Sarah Jane and like how she shaped Rani's 
life, but also career and ethos and mentality and problem solving. And I think that she became for these kids what the doctor was for her. And I think in the same Mm. way for the audience, for the yous and me's, she became to us what we saw in the doctor. And I think it cannot be understated that we see strong, powerful men of any age on screen. We see old westerns with like rugged cowboy like men and then we see stories of like old men telling their stories and we all love david attenborough there are men everywhere of all ages and loved and respected and i think that so often women feel like their stories don't matter past a certain point and women are valued less after a certain point and it was so important of russell to bring like you said an older woman who is given a lot to do and a substantial role and has ramifications for the story of Doctor Who and the world building of Doctor Who. And I think that both Sarah Jane and Elizabeth Sladen are the perfect example of why those stories matter and why they are incredible. Yeah, I agree. And then it's nice because then when we had like that series four ending where everyone comes back together, you know, Sarah Jane on her own holds up as much as the Torchwood like unit does on its own. Like Sarah mm-hmm. Jane in herself is as important as like those three people are, which I really liked. Um that she like just holds her own in that way. Yeah. But yeah, I think like I said, we should do a whole episode. We have well we have talked about the Sarah Jane events before and I know we've looked at one of the stories, but I think there's so much more to be said about Sarah Jane. And I I still really want to do an episode on Beyond Bannerman Road. And I'm I'm trying to get you to listen to it. Can everyone please tweet Alistair just at Alistair on Twitter. I can't remember what your handle is, my darling, but you need to listen to this at Big Finish Audio because it is so, so good. And I really do think that it just goes to show what an important character Sarah Jane is, even when Sarah Jane isn't around. You know what I mean? Like her legacy carries on. Um, yeah. <laughs> Are you going to listen to it? I, I will try setting aside some time to listen to it. You know what? I've been doing so many big drives lately. That would have been a great time for you to put it on. Mm-hmm. And I, the fool is me that I didn't. There you go. Right. Well, Sam tragically that's all we've got time for this week we're gonna have to leave it there my darling but i was just about to start talking about martha oh you're just gonna start talking about martha we'll tell you what come back next week and we'll be talking all about martha plus donna plus the companions who never were exactly well thank you so much for listening to this part one of the two-parter episode of hula la i love that we have a week off and then we're like we're doing half an episode <laughs> <laughs> no it, it's good i promise i'm really underselling this it actually it's going to be good we wanted to give you good content good quality content but please reach out to us on all the social medias twitter or x i guess now threads instagram tiktok all of which are at hula pod let us know what do you think of the companions of this era of doctor who yeah, what do you think about the Doctor being in love? How does that sit with you? How do you feel about that? What do you think about the Doctor being there with the Mrs. and the X? Yeah, and uh, and what are your memories of Sarah Jane Smith and the Sarah Jane Adventures? Did you watch them on CBBC now that CITV is sadly deceased? How are you feeling about that? CITV that died? You, CITV's done. Did, this is news to me. Standalone <laughs> channel, it's gone. Oh my God, I'm gagged. Wait, what's there, what's there instead? Done. Nothing, it's off, it's gone. Oh, RIP. Yeah, if you want to talk about that, this is a safe space. <laughs> you can reach out to us on any of our social media, all of which are at Hula La Pod. I'll, uh, be, I'll be there too. I'll be the one replying, being like, it died. <laughs> it died. Donald Trump reaction. I'm only now, I'm only just now hearing this. <laughs> I'm only you know just now saying? hearing this. Flu jeans, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 I just think of that clip of Lady Gaga. She's like, I said that? Well, I mean, I don't remember it, but like it's it, it says I did. <laughs> <laughs> And if you're feeling very generous and you have a moment, we'd really appreciate if you could leave a review of our podcast as well, wherever you listen, Spotify, Apple Music, whatever it is you're using to listen. You can't listen on Apple Music, I've made that up. Apple Podcasts, (laughs) wherever it is you're listening to the podcast, leave us a five-star review and leave a little comment. We always really, really appreciate it and it helps us reach more listeners. Exactly. Well, thank you as always for listening to Lala and we will see you next week for part two of our chat about the companions from RCZ1. Have a beautiful week. Love you lots. Bye. Bye.